All right, students, so welcome back to another semester of Dante's of the Divine Comedy. We're starting where we left off. Welcome to the Sphere of Mercury, Sphere 2 of the Divine Comedy Paradiso, uh, Canticle 3. Dante's of the Divine Comedy 2019 slash 2020. Now we're in a new year. Lecture 29, Dante's Paradiso, Sphere 2, Mercury, slides 38 to 55. Today we're mostly going to be focusing on Canto 6, though I will start with a quote from Canto 5. And as an arrow which will strike the target before the string of the bow has come to rest, so we speed onwards, or so we sped onwards, to the second kingdom, the second sphere, from the sphere of the moon. So a couple things I just want you to recall. We are continuing from our introduction to Dante's Paradiso from the last school week that we had. And we'll be considering Cantos 5 to 7 here, mostly 6 today. A uh, couple things to remember. Remember that the sphere of the moon was full of oath breakers, people who were supposed to be consistent or constant, but were in fact not constant. Recall the names of the two nuns that we met there who were forced out of their convents, and yet unlike uh, Musius, who we heard about, they did not, uh, uh, or Lawrence, St. Lawrence, they did not do uh, quite as much as they could have to keep their vows. They could have uh, died rather than going, but that would have been a little bit extreme. In any case, we ran into Picarda Donati. Uh, uh, remember, she is, the, uh, uh, she is related to Corso. Donati as well as Horaci Donati, and so we have Donatis in all three canticles of the Divine Comedy. Uh, Chiampa Donati as well amongst the uh, serpents, the, uh, the uh, thieves down in the Inferno. And uh, also Empress Constance, recall that she was the grandmother of Manfred and the mother of Frederick. In fact, we're going to mention Frederick again today, and Pierre de la Vigna in the context of a man named Romeo. We're going to be talking a lot about Rome today. And just something interesting to note, that first tercet that I read to you, like an arrow that strikes the target before the bowstring had been stilled, so we sped into the second realm. That is a literary term that you need to know called hysteron proteron. That means the after before the before, which means uh, how that was described is the thing that happens secondarily was described as primary. Hitting the uh, mark as a shooter of an arrow, you hit the mark after you pull the bow back. You don't uh, hit the mark first and then pull the back and then pull the bow. And so there's an inversion in temporality here. And that's going to uh, really get us going today because we're going to start in the middle, then we're going to go back to the past, then we're going to go from the past into the present and into the future. And so we're going to get a very sophisticated account of the history of Rome from its, uh, well, what was once current to Justinian in the 6th century uh, to its mythological past and on to its uh, historical future. Uh, which is now our historical past, interestingly enough. All right. Now, Mercury. A couple of basic things to know about Mercury. The theme is ambition or seeking worldly fame. These were adventurers, essentially. Uh, the virtue is hope, and it is marred by ambition. So hope for yourself rather than for something superior, simply, to yourself. We're going to see uh, a couple major concepts. I'm going to mention three of them here, but only one of them are we really going to get to today. One is Roman history, and therefore one's place within it. The a sort of thesis of Canto VI will be that you do not know who you are as an individual. You are not oriented correctly unless you know your place in history. And so, like how a human learns about who they are, you learn first about your present circumstances. Then you learn about the past, and once you know who you are based on where you are in the present and where you have come from or your people have come from in the past, then you can perhaps see the, uh, uh, the uh, circular nature of time or where you're going in the future. To know the future, or rather to know the past, is to know the future as well as you possibly can, is Dante's idea, which is uh, not a bad idea. In any case, uh, concepts that will be discussed a little more in Canto 7, I don't know that we're really going to go of them, over, over them are just vengeance versus just punishment. How can you justly take revenge on somebody who justly punished someone else? So this uh, Orestes the Jews as an example. He, uh, he takes vengeance on his mother uh, killing his father, which is just, but then he can also be justly punished because obviously he still murders his mother. And so uh, there's a duality there. And then, of course, also the uh, uh, Dante takes on the concept of original sin and why uh, a god would choose to become a man, uh, I told you a little before lecture, the idea is to forgive man for something unforgivable in order to bestow grace or dignity on man above his station. To make man worthy of the grace of God is to make man, uh, uh, in, in a way, equal to uh, a living God, though, of course, man dies. And so uh, that shouldn't be taken uh, as a perfect equality. In any case, 
people that we are going to run into today. Emperor Justinian, he's going to talk the entire Canto VI, and a guy named, in French, Romeo de, or de Villanueva, uh, but we'll just call him Romeo. We'll call him Romeo after the Italian conventions. That's how he's represented in your text as well as um, the Italian itself. So, Canto VI. Don't write this quite yet, but do listen to it. Canto VI, which then follows in the sphere of Mercury, is unique in that it features a single speaker. It is the only canto in all of the cantos, all hundred cantos of the Divine Comedy that has one speaker from the first line to the last line. Okay, know that. This speaker is from the 6th century. His name, uh, and he was the emperor of what he would have called Rome, but we call Byzantium. It's the Eastern Roman Empire. And his name was Justinian. Know his dates. He ruled 527 to 565 CE. Also notice what century that is. 527 to 565, that's the 6th century. So a, uh, an emperor from the 6th century is going to talk in the 6th canto about Roman history. That is one of the first parallels with 6. We will see several more today. He's going to give a sort of mythological history of the Roman Empire leading up to Dante's times, uh, which are afflicted with issues between the Ghibellines, uh, which are represented <coughs> by an eagle, and the Guelphs, which are represented by a lily, which is sort of a stylized eagle in any case. Uh, and we'll even get down to the individual level with Romeo. And so we're going to go from sort of the broadest possible movements of history down to the most particular uh, movements of history, almost suggesting that uh, what makes for the big uh, events in history are the individual choices of man. You are. Right. Sorry to give this. Okay, yes, go. So, Sphere of Mercury is full of the fame seekers. Facts you need to know. Justinian, he was a 6th century uh, Byzantine Roman emperor. We first saw him mentioned, actually, in Purgatorio VI. We heard about the so-called Justinian Code. He was the man that came up with the Corpus Juris uh, Civilis. The, uh, uh, it's the corpus or, or body of Roman law. He came up with these excellent laws that apparently there are not kings during Dante's time capable of implementing. If you have great laws, but you have four kings who don't implement them, uh, well, uh, what is the value of those laws? Well, you know, you need... In order, <laughs> virtues are nothing without being embodied. Laws are the same. If they're not e executed or implemented or uh, protected, well, then they're not very good laws. In any case, the discourses on the path of Roman domination as a path of the spreading of the divine or civilizing consciousness in the world. Something interesting about that. He uses the image of the eagle, and he talks about the westward expansion of Rome. And in fact, he mentions that uh, there, there is an issue uh, with um, Rome starting to move east at some point, and that, that is sort of a, a crime against nature. And something interesting about that, I think, just for making a connection to America in two ways, is A, of course, we consider our expansion to the west, the expansion of the eagle, of course, as well, because we are represented by an eagle because of our Roman antecedents. And, of course, we did use that sort of rhetoric called uh, manifest destiny when we went from around the east coast and the middle of this country out into the west coast where we all, of course, live. In fact, there were people in the 19th century that said it was the destiny of America to reach from, uh, from sea to shining sea, uh, from the Atlantic all the way to the Pacific. In any case, this has a literary antecedent. A emperor, an emperor, a leader type figure in the sixth book of a book telling the history of Rome. Well, when did that happen? Well, you recall the Aeneid from last year. Book six of the Aeneid is the book in which Aeneas goes to the underworld. But in the underworld, he gets to go up to Elysium, the paradise, the place of reward. And in Elysium, he runs into his father, who has been his ruler. And what does his father talk about? He talks about the mythological history of the people that Aeneas will found. And so there's a correlation not only between uh, the century in which Justinian lived, the 6th century, and the 6th canto in which he writes, but the 6th book of the Aeneid does uh, the exact same thing as the 6th canto of the Paradiso. Uh, except for since uh, Virgil was obviously writing in the 1st century BCE, he knows much less of the history of Rome than Dante, who's writing in the 14th century. A lot more has happened. In fact... Just to read you a little bit of this. So Aeneas has gone down to the underworld. He's chosen not to go down to Tartarus. Dante will later do that. That's his inferno. He goes to the fields of blessedness. There he sees his dad, tries to hug him a few times. Doesn't quite work out for him because his dad's not made of matter anymore. And then his dad around line 999 in the Man of Long translation says, Listen to me. My tongue will now reveal the fame that is to come from Darden's sons and what Italian children 
wait for you. Well, what Justinian will tell is what has happened rather than what will happen largely. He even talks about more, this is several lines later, more Romulus, the son of Mars, he will join Numitor's grandfather on Earth when Elia, his bloodline, gives him birth out of the bloodline of Asaracus. Now turn your two eyes here to look upon your Romans, your own people. Here is Caesar and all the life of Eulus, and then all the way down to uh, talking uh, very sadly about uh, Marcius, who died young, who was the uh, adopted son of um, Caesar Augustus, his, his sister's the, uh, son, who died as a young person. Uh, in any case, remember this. There are more connections with six. As I've been saying in both the Inferno six, as well as the Purgatorio six, Canto six is the political canto. And now, bang, we now see that we have been on six, Six and six. We have seen Shiaco in the Inferno. Shiaco, we recall, was a glutton. He had a very personal seeming uh, 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 um, issue. But remember what he talked about. He talked about the four worst foreign times in hell. So he talked about issues in city politics. Well, then we ran into Sordello in Purgatorio Six. And he talked about political issues in not just Florence, because he was a man to and of course, just like Virgil, but in Italy itself. Well, now, with Justinian, we're going to talk about issues in world politics. Things are going to get bigger and bigger. It's almost as if a small issue is that which becomes a large issue. Uh, uh, the foundations of a small issue, rather, lead to the same sorts of big issues. In any case, uh, now Justinian himself talks about the history of the Roman Empire back to its mythic origins. Let's keep moving. All right. The Roman path which covers or scars the world. He starts from Constantine's conversion. We'll see Constantine in the uh, Sphere of Jupiter, uh, by the way, just like we're finally seeing Justinian here. Uh, he says that, uh, you know, Con Constantine did a couple very bad things. We obviously know about 325 and the conversion of Constantine, and that being a major issue for Dante because that corrupted the integrity of the church and the state, uh, unifying them into one rather than keeping them balanced as two, which create one good society. But that, uh, also Constantine moved the Roman capital from Rome to Byzantium. Like I said earlier, that's a move from west to east. That is the opposite of the appropriate, uh, of the natural way of things. And one of the uh, sort of naturalistic pieces of evidence for this is, where does the sun rise? Rises in the east. Where does it set? In the, in the west. Which means that it moves where, or in which direction during the course of a day? Westward, right. And so people are supposed to move westward. They're supposed to follow the path of the sun, which, you know, in, in original time, people considered the sun sort of a god, and then all of a sudden there was a god of the sun, until you get into Christian times and talk about God being light, which still has, of course, obviously, very much uh, connections with the sun, our ultimate light. In any case, he then very obliquely uh, uh, says who he was, but he says, I was Caesar and I am Justinian, indicating that his rank as a human in the world matters not. His person, his choices matter in heaven. It doesn't matter what your rank was in the world because uh, a claim that he will make by the end of Canto 6 is that, well, you know, uh, the world gets things wrong. There are plenty of people that are popes and kings that have no business being popes and kings. And so whether you are uh, dignified, worthy, merit what you have in the world or not is highly suspect. And so in the Paradiso, you get what you deserve. On the wor in the world, probably not. And this has uh, major ramifications for Dante because what's going to happen to him in two years after this poem, after this visionary poem, what will happen to him in his own city? He will be exiled unjustly by his perspective. And so, Justinian was Justinian the Great. He ruled 527 to 565, just that R there, that. And then he wrote a, the sort of Bible of Roman law. I call it the Bible, or it is often called the Bible of Roman law because it is the foundation of Roman law. And the uh, Latin for it is corpus, that means body, juris, that means law of law. Sibylis, uh, corpus or body of civil law. Cool. All right. Now, uh, he's mentioned Constantine, and he uses the image of an eagle expanding first eastward and then westward. He then mentions Aeneas's victory in the first capital of Rome. That was Alba Longa that was uh, led by Ascanius. You recall that from the Aeneid last year. He mentions also several famous events in Roman history. One of uh, the most famous ones was under, uh, I think, it was Numa, the second emperor of Rome, was the so-called rape of the Sabine women. Historians go to a very interesting, uh, 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 I would say, a depth to, to suggest that the Sabine women were not actually literally raped. They were simply abducted 
from their, their land. They were actually treated with great respect by the Roman people. Uh, the idea was that the Roman men who first founded the city, there were no ladies, so they had to go find some ladies. And what they did is, well, what you would have expected them to do, given the time uh, and uh, what you know from the Iliad and Odyssey, they went and invaded a neighboring land and took their women away. Uh, <laughs> and so, that is how Rome mythologically acquired its women through strength. Then we see, uh, we go a little bit farther into history during the Punic Wars, the Carthaginian Wars. Remember, there were three of them. The ancient enemy of Rome was, of course, Carthage. That's why we have uh, Dido, the leader of Carthage, fall in love with uh, Aeneas, one of the founders, in a way, of progenitors of Rome. And then their relationship falls apart. That's supposed to indicate or mythologically give the reason for why Carthage and Rome fell apart. Though the actual reason is that they were fighting over who would dominate the uh, naval space between them. There was a, a sea between them, and they, you know, uh, that, usually it is a territorial dispute that leads to war between people. Uh, in any case, that was uh, the actual reason. In any case, Hannibal was eventually defeated by Scipio and Pompey, Scipio Africanus, he received that cognomen based on his, uh, his great deeds, it'd be like being called Alexander the Great, rather than having your last name, and recall also that he crossed the Alps with elephants, though I think I'm told that he only had like one elephant left by the time he got to the end of it, because they didn't do well with the Roman winter. Uh, Rome, or Italy. Europe's obviously a little bit colder than Africa, uh, even northern Africa. All right. There was then another major event. After the Punic Wars, of course, there was a civil war between Pompey and Caesar. Uh, that civil war led to Caesar crossing a river that was right in front of Rome. It had never been crossed by any enemy, let alone ally, <coughs> it was crossed by Caesar. This was considered a major event, sort of a betrayal by Caesar. But then Caesar himself was betrayed by Brutus and Cassius. And that is, of course, why they are being chewed in hell by Satan in the deepest level of it. The idea being here that Dante believes that as a person, the most important thing you can do is lead to the stability of your society, that you can uphold your empire. And what did these men do by killing Caesar, who was a monarch, an emperor uh, of sorts? Well, they stood against their empire. They worked against their people. They worked against themselves. They did a foolish thing, and because of that, they're being eaten for all time. In any case, there was also the death of Mark Antony and Cleopatra. That was the second uh, civil war after uh, uh, Caesar and Pompey. And in fact, there were a couple of different cities, Modena, as well as I forget the second one, that uh, were sacked, and many, many people died because of that. And uh, Dante's here adding a personal note. Uh, uh, history so often seems like a power struggle between uh, leading uh, nations or leading men. It's like Mark Antony versus Octavian, or, or Pompey versus Caesar, or Caesar versus uh, Cassius and Brutus. But uh, often, what gets left in the wake is the fact that lots of people die because of these uh, conflicts. And, you know, lots of children lose their fathers. Lots of fathers lose their homes. And, uh, you yeah, know, there's a lot of collateral damage in these conflicts. And so, Dante is trying to suggest something like, the less conflicts we have, the less pain there is in the world, the better the world can be and the more divine the world can be. And I'd say, you know, having lived in a time of extreme peace, the last 20 years or so, which hopefully continues on, uh, that seems to be true. The more stable things are, the better people's lives are, the less you have to worry about people you care about dying every day of your life, which is a terrible sort of feeling you have to live with. In any case, the spread of the empire is considered to, remember that the Pax Romana, and you will need to know these dates, was from 27 BC to CE 180. That's 207 years of peace during a highly, uh, we would say, a highly barbaric, less civilized time. They didn't even have the internet. All right. There was then a third Caesar. First one's Julius. Second one is Octavian. His name is Tiberius. If you're a Star Trek fan, you know that that's the middle name of, uh, I think, Captain Kirk. Um, if you're a fan of that sort of thing, anybody a Star Trek fan? Maybe as a synchronistic at this point. In any case, uh, and then we get a short history of the Guelphs and the Ghibellines and Charles I and II of Anjou. Remember that the Guelphs, this is most important here, are represented by lilies. Lilies are funereal fl flowers, and they look sort of like a stylized eagle. And the Ghibellines buy an imperial eagle. This is sort of corruption of the symbol of empire. Why is it a corruption of the symbol of empire? Well, what did I just say? Uh, the whole idea of empire is that you are united under one lord, under one set of laws, so that you have as few conflicts as possible, so you have as little violence and death as possible. Well, what do these Guelphs and these Ghibellines stand for? They stand for division. Division not within an empire, but within even a city. And so, do they have any right to use an imperial symbol, like an eagle, if they stand for division, discord, violence, and death, and not stability, safety, and uh, uh, all the comforts of um, 
solidarity. No, absolutely not. That is Justinian's perspective. And remember, Justinian, of course, is being written by Dante the poet. All right. Mercury then gets described a little bit. This little star is studied with good spirits who exerted themselves in order to acquire honor and reputation. Just to let you know, uh, that's what it is we're talking about. Mercury describes reason for differences in souls. Different voices make notes sound sweet. And so different stations in our life make a sweet harmony among these spheres. All right. Something I uh, wanted to say about that. So uh, one of the themes I talked about yesterday with you to uh, reiterate to you what it is we're doing in the Divine Comedy is talking about unity versus diversity. Why are humans different? Well, part of the claim made here is that just as different notes within a measure, within a musical composition, make for one beautiful harmony, so must there be different sorts of people with different sorts of abilities within one uh, uh, society. In fact, the more differentiated people are within a society, the more complex and beautiful the society can be. In fact, uh, this is an argument for why people should be different within a society. In fact, there are modern studies, I think I've done in either Norway or Sweden, that suggest that the more egalitarian or equal a society is, the more maximally differentiated the personalities of the person within, or persons within that society are. Which means that uh, the more different people are within a society, uh, uh, or, or rather, the more equal a society is, the more diverse it becomes, which I think is very interesting. Uh, in any case, I'm going to read this to you, but then we are going to uh, move on from this. So, just to broadly speak about Mercury, to step away from the path of Rome, the path of the eagle, and the uh, speech of Justinian, our emperor from the 6th century. Because they so longed for earthly honor, prestige, and glory, they fulfilled their active lives, but did not focus on developing their contemplative lives, which would have led them towards the object of all thought, God. Since God's justice is infallible, that means uh, unerring uh, and perfect, incapable of erring, in fact. Therefore, the place where these souls rest is the perfect place for them. As there are different wonderful smells and sights in a garden where different notes in the symphony, so are these souls still called shades, perfectly content with their allotted space in the universe. Okay, something interesting just to mention to you. In uh, the time of Dante's celestial mechanics using the Ptolemaic system, the smallest, most, uh, 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 the smallest, least proud planet was Mercury. And so I, it's deeply ironic and interesting that the people that most wanted to be recognized for their own merits are given the smallest planet in order to be represented by. And so that's part of the Dantistic irony there. All right, and the problem with that is that these people overemphasize the active life and, rather than the contemplative life. Um, and remember that Dante uh, comes down uh, differently from Aristotle. Aristotle believes contemplative life, best life. But remember through the third dream that Dante had in the Purgatorio <coughs> of Leah and Rachel that, well, he actually believes that the best life is a balance between activity and contemplation between uh, a work and rest. That the balance must be found that they are both essential parts of a good life. These people didn't quite get it right. They were a little too active, a little too uh, light on the thinking. All right. Justinian then uh, comes down, after all this mythological history, after all these incredible people, he talks about somebody that you would not ever hear about in any history class ever unless uh, Dante had mentioned him. And his name is Romeo, Romeo de Villanueva, and uh, he was from 1170 to 1250. And so a couple of reasons why I mention him. His name is obviously Romeo. Romeo means somebody who went on a pilgrimage to Rome. So he's still technically talking about Rome. Instead of talking about a nation, history, or mythology, he's now talking about, or, or political factions, he's now gone from the broadest possible strokes down to the most specific possible strokes. And in fact, this man is not even a king. This is not Caesar Augustus, this is not Caesar uh, Julius, this is not Tiberius, this is not, uh, this is not Numa or Aeneas or Anchises, this is a courtier. This is just uh, some, essentially just some guy. And, well, well, who was he exactly? Well, he was a guy who got treated somewhat poorly in the world, uh, suggesting to us that the justice of the world is a little bit off, but the justice of God a little bit better, but uh, that doesn't do much for somebody while they're alive. In any case, who was this guy, Romeo? Well, there was a Count of Provence named Raymond Berenger, and he has an A at the end of your translation, but the translation I was using, he has an E at the end of his name. He had four daughters. Each one needed to be set up with a man to be married. And this guy, uh, Romeo, set each one of these women up with a man who would later become king, and so he made sure that each one of the sons of Raymond Berenger, or excuse me, each one of the daughters of Raymond Berenger, would become queens. He did his job perfectly, as well as you can possibly 
do it. Uh, you're a queen. You, you, you received a top level guy at this time and uh, in this day and age, in that day and age. So he did his job perfectly. That said, we know what the particular advice of the courts is from Pierre Delavigne. Anybody remember what he said? The particular advice of the courts is, and you wish to have what others do not. Envy, envy, envy afflicted him. And even though he did his job perfectly well, he endured unjust persecution. In fact, he was dismissed from the court, and he ended his life as a beggar. He was a beggar, a tremendous fall from grace. As a courtier who got four princesses to become queens, setting up wonderful marriages, you would imagine he would deserve great wealth and honor, but he got poverty and death. Now, why do I bring this up? A couple reasons. First thing is to show that the justice of the world, this will be a major theme in the course of the, uh, the Paradiso, is off, but also to draw a parallel between this man, Romeo, and Pierre de Lavigne. Remember Pierre de Lavigne, the suicide from Canto 13. Remember what his job was. He was the, uh, we say, the spin doctor of, uh, uh, of Frederick II. Remember the heretic father of Manfred, who we met down in uh, uh, the Purgatorio. Uh, now, Pierre de Lavigne, when envious courtiers spoke against him and had him lose his job, what did he do? Because he was so proud he could not deal with being abased, losing his job, losing his position. He hanged himself. That's why the suicides uh, uh, are trees, which will have their bodies hung from them. Well, that's because he was too proud. Well, what did Romeo do when he lost his rank unjustly? Did he kill himself? No, he accepted the injustice in the world. And he humbly became a beggar and had to beg for his food, even though it's described... Uh, is literally, he is literally described by Dante as having given 12 for 10, which means he gave more than he was asked for rather than less, which is so common in this world. Um, Romeo ended up begging in poverty, though he gave 7 and 5 for every 10, or 12 for every 10. <laughs> the world is blind. The whole idea is this. This is a canto of inversion. Just like the justice of the world is inverted, so here we have not a courtier praising a king, but rather a king praising a courtier. A, 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 a king, or emperor in fact, even more than a king, who was uh, praising mythological history and highlighting the deeds of the great. Well, he's not only highlighting the deeds of people you would expect to be highlighted, but also of normal people, uh, uh, average people people who do good things. And what lesson is that supposed to teach you? Well, two. One is this. Are you necessarily going to get what you deserve in this world based on what Justinian has said, even if you do good things? No. You shouldn't expect to. Remember the fire kings last year. They offered tremendous zinnia to Odysseus. They gave him free conveyance home. What was their reward from Poseidon? He put a mountain on top of them. It's like, that's great. Uh, you know, really deserving. Not the case here. But the second thing is, do you have to be an emperor? Do you have to be Aeneas in order to do good things in the world that are worthy of merit? No. And just because you're not recognized for the merit you have, does that mean that it does not matter? I think that's a very powerful lesson. Should you do good? Because people will say good things about you. They will help your reputation. Should you do good? Because it is good. Well, what is Justinian's perspective here? Highlighting this no name, this nobody, named Romeo. Good is of good is good regardless of who knows it. Because most people don't know it, is his perspective in this world. People can't, we don't judge properly down in this world. We judge people by their hair color, by what they're wearing, this and that. Accidents, incidental things, things that don't matter. We very rarely judge them by their actual what. What's that thing that people say is so important and your choices build it? character. We don't judge people by their character because we so often don't understand their character. Uh, and I, I think that that's sort of a, a, a not a cynical or a pessimistic but sort of a sad thing to understand. And I would say that I do, I do not disagree with Dante in saying this sort of thing. It is very hard to see the worth of a person just by looking at them, just by talking to them, even just by knowing them. Uh, because how well do you know somebody? How often do you see them? What do you know about other people? In any case, yes, that is the end of two Okay.